get started. Uh, I think everybody's running a little bit behind today. Uh, so I'm Danielle McDermott, and I'm the medical director at the University of Colorado Hospital Epilepsy Monitoring Unit. And I'm a neurologist and I'm an epileptologist. And it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Thank you all for coming. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about everything. And so I thought, well, how can I best structure this talk about everything? Uh, and I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some learning objectives here. Uh, and the foundation of this talk is really going to be about advocacy and how we can use knowledge about epilepsy um, to understand all of the options that we have in treating epilepsy. So the, I, there's been different talks, I, I know, in um, this uh, symposium, and, and the different uh, talks may be very um, deep as far as the breadth of, of the talk, and um, there are talks to come. Uh, but this is meant to be an overview, and um, we'll be touching upon many of the different talks that you may go to today. So we'll talk a little bit about what is epilepsy and the difference between having epilepsy and then medication-resistant epilepsy. Also, what is an epilepsy center? How is that different than going to a neurologist? What is the impact of epilepsy? And what might be treatment goals and treatment options? And again, knowing advocacy for yourself and then with the physician that you partner with. So, there's, uh, I know some of you may have been to a talk today about um, understanding more about what is an epileptic seizure. There's a talk going on right now about what is a non-epileptic seizure. But epileptic seizures are caused by abnormal and excessive electrical activity in the nerve cells. So the nerve cells are in the outer layer of the brain, which is the cortex. The cortex is also referred to as gray matter. So during a seizure, there's imbalance in these electrical impulses. <clears throat> And this leads to electrical activity that then causes the seizure. So seizures can also be resulted uh, by uh, sudden changes in the brain due to triggers. These are um, triggers can be alcohol, drugs, injuries, strokes, abnormal blood sugar, and electrolytes. These are called provoked seizures. Uh, often no medical treatment is necessary because the treatment is removing the trigger. So then what is epilepsy? So epilepsy is actually the fourth most common neurological disorder that affects people of all ages. If seizures recur repeatedly without any provocation or any trigger, as I referred to earlier, we say that a person with the seizure disorder um, has epilepsy. <clears throat> so epilepsy means that you have chronic or recurrent seizures without any trigger. So the word epilepsy does not mean anything about the cause of a person's seizures or anything about the severity of the person's seizures or moreover anything about what the seizures might look like. Epilepsy is also referred to as a spectrum disorder. That means that there are many seizure types and the control varies from one person to another. So what is this about how do we use EEGs and MRIs in epilepsy? So it's important to know that the EEG and an MRI are normal in most people who have more than one seizure. This is because the EEGs in many cases are abnormal while, um, unless, you get the, uh, unless you get the EEG while the person is having a seizure. So it's very important to understand this concept. If you have epilepsy and you have an EEG that is, that is not done while you are having a seizure, it may very well be normal. So the medication resistance in epilepsy. So what is this? <clears throat> so uh, partial onset, also uh, known as focal seizures, these types of, um, this classification of seizure is uh, a seizure that begins in one part of the brain. Uh, now it may begin in one part of the brain and then it may spread to involve other areas of the brain. Now, about two-thirds of patients who have focal seizures may develop medication resistance. 
There's also a classification of generalized epilepsy or generalized onset seizures. This begins with widespread electrical um, discharge and that involves the entire brain at once. It does not tell you anything about what the seizure may look like outwardly. About one third of patients um, who have generalized onset seizures may develop medication resistance. So what does this mean? What is medication resistance? So it means that if you've tried two medications and you still have seizures, you may have medication-resistant epilepsy. So what is the prevalence of this? 800,000 Americans experience seizures despite taking anti-seizure medications. So after taking two medications, the chance of the third medication will control seizures is less than 5%. This has been uh, reproduced in uh, many different studies. Uh, the most referred to study is done by a, a researchers, um, Quan and Brody. Uh, and they showed that about 50% of people have seizures controlled after using the first medication. So that's the good news, 50%, that's, that's the good news. With the second medication, again, prescribed appropriately at appropriate uh, dose, uh, is 15% is about, more or less. And then it, it becomes a diminishing piece of the pie. Uh, and so then we uh, start to refer to this uh, as pharmacoresistant or medication-resistant epilepsy. So what are the goals in, in treating seizures? So I talk to my patients and I, I make sure that I want to know what are your goals, right? Some patients, say that my main uh, goals are to eliminate uh, medication side effects. The medications are so uh, bad, I, they feel so terrible on my medications, the, I, can't, I can't keep uh, taking these every day. Some patients say the seizures are worse than the medications. So it's very unique to, to each and every person. I need to uh, switch these slides to up. So the impact of epilepsy is so much more than having seizures. So how does epilepsy affect quality of life? So again, it's medication side effects. It's the impact that, med that epilepsy has on relationships, the impact it has on self-esteem, mood, limitations on employment, education, uh, inability to drive or get transportation, the worry that people have about having the next seizure, even if they're seizure free, and the misperceptions about epilepsy, and then the list will go on. So an epilepsy center, so what is this? What is, what is this concept of a, a place that specializes in diagnosing and treating people who have epilepsy? So an epilepsy center has a team, a team of epileptologists, so a neurologist that is specially trained in uh, diagnosing and treating people who have uh, seizures or epilepsy, uh, neurosurgeons who are specially trained in, uh, in providing different types of surgeries for people who have epilepsy, uh, neuropsychologists, neuroradiologists, nurses who are trained in taking care of people who have epilepsy, psychiatrists and technologists who are uh, specially trained to perform EEG studies. So the NAEC is the National Association of Epilepsy Centers. So this is a non-for-profit organization with about 230 epilepsy centers in the United States. And there are standards of care that uh, promote adoption uh, of specific standards through an accreditation um, process. So in Colorado, we have the University of Colorado, we have Children's, Denver Health, Swedish Hospital, Littleton Hospital, and then in Grand Junction, there's St. Mary's. There are different types of levels of epilepsy care. And uh, interestingly, I never even knew that level one was a type of level of epilepsy care, and it's the evaluation that you might get in the emergency room. Uh, and uh, also the type that you might get through your primary care physician. Level two care is the type of care that you may have um, with a general neurologist. 
And then moving on to type three and four are um, epilepsy centers. So these are centers that provide specialized epilepsy care. So the National Association of Epilepsy Centers um, recommends that uh, referral to a comprehensive centers if your seizures are controlled either after three months care by a primary co uh, care provider or 12 months of care by a general neurologist. So to quote, to de delayed or denied referral may be detrimental to a patient's health, safety, and quality of life. So there's a, uh, there, um, three, level three and four centers can be um, distinguished uh, uh, by the level of complexity of surgery. Um, their level four centers uh, have um, slightly uh, higher levels of complexity in the nature of surgeries that they may offer. So what is the advantage of receiving care in an epilepsy center? What might you learn? So the first thing is to get some answers. Uh, the next thing is an incorrect epilepsy di uh, diagnosis. So it's estimated that about 30% of people sent to a comprehensive epilepsy center for uncontrolled seizures find out they were misdiagnosed. Medication management. In many cases, epilepsy diagnosis is correct, but medication regimen was not appropriate for that particular person. And then other options include specialized clinics and epilepsy surgeries. So other benefits of a comprehensive center. So there's a team approach um, that you uh, may have to treat things like mood, anxiety, social needs, specialized clinics, including ketogenic diets, neurofeedback, pregnancy clinics, neurocutaneous disorders such as tuberous sclerosis, non-epileptic seizure clinics. Epileptologists and surgeons with expertise in epilepsy surgery, such as resective surgery, laser surgery, and different types of neurostimulators. And involvement in different types of clinical research for newer medications and medical devices. So when do you know that you need care? So you should seek specialized care if you continue to have seizures after a trial of two medications. So despite these recommendations, 80% of people continue to seek, get care at level one or two centers. So it takes a person with medication-resistant epilepsy an average of 15 years to be referred to a comprehensive epilepsy center. So moving along. <laughs> Uh, so uh, dietary treatments for epilepsy centers. So if uh, uh, medications are uh, not your friend, there are dietary therapies, and uh, there are different types. Now these all have something in common, which is significant carbohydrate restrictions and generous fat intake. So, yum. Uh, <laughs> So the, the, there are, um, they are referred to as the ketogenic diets. So if you put an S on the back, they, it encompasses them all. Um, there's the standard ketogenic diet. There's the modified Atkins diet, and it's called modified because it's used as a medical treatment. Um, and then there's the low glycemic index diet. So to compare um, the three, so here's a, the so-called standard diet. Uh, I really don't know what that is anymore. Um, and then uh, you have the ketogenic diet here where you have about 90% fat. I can't even imagine 90% fat, but um, there's 90% fat. The modified Atkins diet is about 64% fat, and it may range um, in, if you can imagine, carbohydrate intake between uh, 20 to 30 grams per day. And then the low glycemic index uh, 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 diet is about 60% fat over here. So there's a comparison. There's a, uh, a talk about these uh, different diets in, in detail, but the one thing that's very important is that it's monitored. Um, you need labs, supplements, things like this, because if you imagine, this is quite restrictive, and you may become deficient in certain things. So it requires monitoring. 
So cannabis, I was asked to talk about cannabis. All right, so it was actually recognized as an anti-convulsant in the 19th century. So the cannabinoid receptors or cannabis receptors are everywhere in the brain. So the, the take home message is, is that there are mixed results. So THC has either anti or pro convulsant effects or uh, seizure producing effects depending on the dose and depending on the model, meaning the, the type of seizure model, the animal model that it's tested in. There are many cannabidiols with variable effects. So I remember going to many conferences and they, these researchers that have done this research their whole life put these slides up on the screen and there's, they're full of arrows going in every direction. Um, so it's, it's quite complicated. Um, it's important to understand that also, um, the, depending on how it's used, there may be negative health consequences. So um, smoking um, cannabis may have pulmonary uh, effects that, that need to be recognized. There's also been documented of um, potentially having withdrawal seizures depending on how it's used. Um, so it's also um, cannot be prescribed except in states with medical cannabis. Now, um, that's with the exception of the medication Epidiolex, which is highly purified CBD extracted directly from plants. It's nearly 100% CBD. Uh, this is FDA approved for Dravet syndrome. It was shown to decrease convulsive seizures and Gastaut syndrome with a decrease in drop seizures. Uh, the medication is dosed per weight and um, it's important to understand also that it may interact with other anti-seizure medications. So those need to be monitored when a patient is prescribed Epidiolex. But that is promising. Uh, the next I'm gonna move on to some devices. So it's spanning the uh, gamut here. Uh, so the vagus nerve stimulator. So it's a, it's a medical device. Um, it does not necessarily need um, something called intracranial monitoring that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, and um, vagus nerve stimulator is placed in here. This is the uh, battery generator. It's placed in the neck. And then there is a wire and a coil that goes around the vagus nerve on the left side up here above the clavicle. <clears throat> the VNS uh, as it's referred to, delivers a pulsed stimulation around the clock, 24 hours a day. Um, after it's placed in the operating room, the VNS, the patient comes back to their doctor and the settings are increased about every two, maybe four weeks uh, for about six visits. And then the device is allowed to work. Um, about 10 to uh, five to 10 percent of patients may get, become seizure free uh, it's, not, it's not advertised or should not be uh, 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 proposed as a, uh, uh, to cure epilepsy, um, more as a palliative treatment. Um, but for most people, it will reduce frequency and severity of seizures. It can also be used to help interrupt and stop seizures by use of swiping a magnet over to the device when the patient may become symptomatic of seizures. So this is, uh, comes from a study, um, and uh, this was a, a meta-analysis that showed that the VNS may be more effective in people who have generalized seizures than focal seizures. A meta-analysis means that it was a, a pooled a group of um, randomized control trials, non-blinded uh, trials, and so forth. And so this was partial or focal seizures, mixed seizures, and generalized seizures. So there was a, a difference between focal and generalized seizures, and maybe the people who had generalized seizures had a better response with the VNS. So I mentioned intracranial monitoring, uh, and if you're not familiar with what that is, um, that um, is a monitoring that is done um, within or on top of the brain. So uh, what we do is um, in the epilepsy monitoring unit, uh, we, most of our monitoring is done on the scalp. So we do video and EEG concurrently at the same time, and we wait for a person to have a seizure, and we try to determine the best we can 
where the seizure is coming from. Now, if a patient is a surgical candidate and we feel like we uh, need more information to better localize or figure out where the seizure is coming from, we may um, recommend what's called phase two monitoring. Now, that may also be necessary in cases where the MRI may not show an abnormality. So intracranial monitoring refers to seizure monitoring, again, when electrodes are inside the skull or on the surface of the brain. These are placed in the operating room. However, the patient then comes back to our monitoring unit and again, does has that process done where the, we wait for seizures to occur. So these are two depictions. Here, you can see these are called depth electrodes. These are placed stereotactically. So that means under MRI guidance in the operating room. Um, this is quite extensive. This is, a, these are, this is a grid of electrodes that are placed on the surface of the brain. This is what we do most of the time. I would say probably 99% of the time we've moved more to a stereo EEG. It's, as you might um, think, uh, comparing these two, this looks a little bit less invasive. Patients recover pretty quickly. Um, after the seizures are obtained, they go home probably after a day or so. Uh, the next device I'm going to tell you about is called the RNS, or Responsive Neurostimulator. Um, the Responsive Neurostimulation technique um, involves electrodes placed on or in the brain in order to stimulate areas that have been found to trigger seizures. So the um, RNS stimulation is aimed at interrupting seizures and has been shown to reduce seizure frequency. Patients also become seizure-free with um, RNS. However, again, this is more of a palliative treatment. This is not um, uh, purported to be, uh, should not be uh, uh, advertised, uh, so to speak, as a cure for epilepsy. Now, electrodes have to be placed with a good understanding of where the seizure starts. Many patients, but not all, need um, invasive monitoring. Patients then download the data from their device onto a laptop computer, um, typically once a day, and then they send their information to me to review about once a week. Um, patients then have follow-up appointments every two to three months at the beginning of the course of their treatment. So how does this work? So what happens is that these electrodes are monitoring the brain um, act, uh, continuously. So they're monitoring and they're seeking for the seizure that, that we've told them that the, that area is producing. And then they detect specific patterns that are thought to cause seizures. So it is recording the frequency, timing, and the location of these seizures over months and years in a natural setting. And then automatically, it will stimulate um, to try to abort that seizure, okay? So in the, what is the um, efficacy of, uh, of RNS? So at um, eight years, uh, patients were found to have a 73% median seizure reduction rate. And about 30% of patients had at least one period or greater than six months um, without seizures. So pretty good. Uh, here's an example of a patient that I have um, who this is, you can see this is a, a depiction of an intracranial monitoring. So this is uh, all those electrodes that um, I showed you that could be placed in the brain. So this is an example of a seizure beginning. And the patient had the RNS placed. This is a actual RNS. And these are the electrodes that are on the surface of her brain. And uh, she <clears throat> has had actually periods of seizure freedom. Um, and you can see that this is um, all of the activity that she had at the beginning when the, um, before the device learned how to really uh, detect her seizures. And then as we programmed the device over time, they're uh, basically uh, having, she's having about one a month and has times where she has no seizures. So laser surgery is the last therapy I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, and laser surgery is a newer 
and minimally invasive surgical technique that can be used in patients who have small, about two centimeter or about one inch lesions that cause seizures. So using a stereotactic, again, MRI guided um, system, uh, the surgeon puts um, a small hole in the skull and a tip is placed in the middle of the target area. And the laser tip is placed in the middle of this area and energy is transferred, monitored by MRI to allow precise control of the laser. So the, the, the destruction of the lesion by heat is then called thermal ablation. Because there is only a small wound, there is less risk, and the um, length of stay is reduced. So the recovery time is expected to be faster than opening the skull and um, getting to that uh, deeper area. <clears throat> so this is an example of a uh, laser ablation that's heating up that area. Um, and uh, this is the laser tip. And there, okay. So I moved a lot faster than I usually do. So the last slide is about advocacy. So, um, you know, becoming your own advocate. And so if you are suffering from seizures despite medication, um, prior surgery or having a vagus nerve stimulator, it's important to find your way to a comprehensive epilepsy center for complete evaluation. And I uh, put the NAEC uh, website on here, uh, also the website, website for, uh, for UC Health, but um, I am also have a lot of time for questions, so uh, I'm happy to... Yes. Yes. So Dr. McDermott, I have a question. So you have a lot of different options and they're getting to be more so all the time. How often is it that you recommend surgery or a certain type of modulation and you have pushback from the patient or their family? You know, how often do you have to modify your treatment plan because of the fear factor or the unknowns as you're describing these options to your patients? Are there, are there many times, I guess I would say, that you take a different course than you would ideally want to take because of the, of the unknowns that the patient or their family may experience? So um, what, when we uh, evaluate a patient for epilepsy surgery, uh, there are many steps that go into this evaluation, right? So uh, a patient will first have phase one monitoring, uh, that uh, is done in the EMU, uh, and seizures uh, occur, um, maybe medications are reduced. You know, the first question is setting goals. So what are, what are your goals? And that's done in the clinic. Um, and, you know, the patient, um, first of all, you know, may, that, there's never any coercion <laughs> that occurs. Uh, now, if a patient is interested in maybe exploring the surgical option, the first step would then be the epilepsy monitoring unit. Uh, now, uh, that is then um, done, again, to see if we can figure out where seizures may be coming from. Um, that's the other things that are needed are an MRI to see if we can see if there's any abnormality that sometimes we refer to as a lesion. Um, there may be other... Um, Radio, uh, neuroradiology uh, types of things that we do, like a PET scan. Um, there's, uh, you saw that we have neuropsychology, uh, neuropsychological testing, which is to assess, you know, any deficits in memory or things that have um, occurred as a result potentially of seizures or, um, you know, even medication. Um, so the evaluation is pretty comprehensive. Uh, and again, it's always really guided by a patient's desire. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, you know, it is normal to be scared. Uh, so fear as far as surgery, I think, is um, a very normal reaction. I think that uh, 
you know, kind of though meeting a patient where they are is, is always um, very important. Um, we take all of this information that we get from an evaluation and we discuss it at what we call a um, case conference. A case conference involves all of our epileptologists, our surgeons, our radiologists, and so forth, and we, we discuss the, the various options. Now, not every patient is a candidate for, for surgery. So I may tell the patient that it doesn't seem like you are a candidate for surgery or you are a candidate for these surgeries, and um, let's talk about which ones you may be interested in. Uh, and we kind of go through a risk-benefit type of discussion. Uh, and any time a patient is saying, I'm not feeling comfortable, the, the conversation's on hold, and I say, you know, we can come back to this at any point. Um, and I also kind of explore, you know, what's making you uncomfortable. Um, but again, there's no benefit as as far to me it, uh, to um, make somebody feel uncomfortable about any decision that a patient makes. Um, it's to improve somebody's quality of life, right? So it's um, how can we make quality of life better? Yeah. Hi, can you um, kind of break down the decision-making process to even defining it as epilepsy when someone has lesions has hmm. visible abnormalities versus some, for, versus patients who don't have any seen abnormalities on any scans. How do you determine the difference and where do you go from, for treatment um, from that standpoint? It's a good question. Uh, so it's a good question and it's uh, kind of like, well, there's many different sub, uh, um, kind of sub uh, sets this. So the so lesional versus non-lesional is the big uh, heading. So meaning that there's an abnormal abnormality on the MRI. Uh, so now there may be multiple lesions on the MRI. So um, now if there's no abnormality on the MRI. Um, there may be something that we find on a PET scan or other types of imaging. So I'll put that aside. But um, the patient is more likely to need invasive monitoring, or the patient may not be um, a candidate for a resection or ablation or you know, other types of things. So there's, more, there's likely to be more of an invasive evaluation. As far as lesional epilepsy, the question is how many, how big, is it one? Um, so if there's one lesion, um, the question is, uh, is that lesion causing the epilepsy? Uh, now, if, if the lesion is causing the epilepsy uh, and it's safe to be removed, meaning that that lesion is not involved in language, movement, um, you know, a significant memory function. Uh, so if you can prove that, um, that it's safe to be removed, then um, typically that is, a, uh, that is offered. So it has to be producing the seizures and be safe to be removed. And you have to be pretty darn confident of that. Um, then uh, the next would be if there's more than one, uh, can you uh, can you go down the same algorithm, right? So uh, usually people don't start going uh, on kind of a, what we call fishing expeditions, right? So uh, the brain is important. Um, it's not like, you know, we don't think other parts of the body are not important, but it's, I, I kind of make it a, like, you know, we're not going and having like a bunion removed. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we have to be pretty sure about what we're doing before we do it. <laughs> um, yes, I guess um, if I have a VNS and um, it kind of works, 
but sometimes you don't know if you're going into a seizure. Would an R RNS be a possible like solution to um, that? <laughs> So what I would say is kind of back to the presentation that when I mentioned if you are if you have a VNS and you're still having seizures, um, I would make sure that you're it's, you're hooked in with an epileptologist in an epilepsy center um, because that is that's something that you know that they would be able to answer because back again another slide that I showed said. Um, that no two people are the same. No two epilepsies are the same. And so I'd love to give you the, a great answer right now, um, but the best answer I can give you is to make sure that you're hooked in with an epileptologist. All right, thank you. You're welcome. When you're diagnosing, <clears throat> how do you rule out pseudo seizures? Non-epileptic seizures, yeah. Um, so uh, non-epileptic seizures are evaluated in the, in the monitoring unit. Um, and so the only real way to know that a patient is having non-epileptic seizures is to have an EEG on the head while the patient is having a seizure. Uh, and so there are many that are misdiagnosed uh, that, um, as uh, of non-epileptic seizures that are misdiagnosed as seizures, and maybe seizures that are misdiagnosed as non-epileptic seizures, or people that may even have both. So it's important that, again, um, an epileptologist that is comfortable making that call um, be able to see that on the EEG and take the history, meaning that they really understand the, what's going on and listen to, to the story. talking about that, mm -hmm. and how can you still call them an epileptic seizure? If it's not seizure? the same seizure. They, would, they often look different, but it's occurring in the same person. So about 30, up to 30% of patients with epilepsy have non-epileptic seizures. It's an, um, is that because the brain just stimulates it? Like after stroke, you have, you have seizures. Mm -hmm. Mm, it, the, the mechanism is a little different. So a non-epileptic seizure or non-electrical seizure, whatever you may want to call it. So epilepsy, again, is ec abnormal excitation of the neurons, right? You see it on the EEG 99% um, of the time. There are rare epileptic seizures you can't see on the scalp EEG, but I won't go there. Um, but the, the epileptic seizures... You, you typically see it on an EEG, on the scalp EEG. A non-epileptic seizure is a, um, we, we don't call them pseudo-seizures, we call them non-epileptic seizures, are typically a, a dissociation between the mind and the body. Uh, and it is a outward physical manifestation, right? It's very real to the person. Um, it is not intended. Uh, but it is, it's very real. It's treated very differently than epilepsy. Yes. Okay. Uh, have there been any long-term studies on uh, the effects of various epilepsy medications on a person's general health, organ function, et cetera? Oh, wow, that's, uh, it's a whopper. Um, <laughs> all right. So it depends which organ, um, you know, so for example, bone health. Uh, yes, there's a lot of studies and actually we're, um, there's a uh, nurse practitioner in our group that's actually looking at this. Um, how do we better uh, preventative, preventively address bone health in patients with epilepsy? Because uh, we don't do a great job. Um, so bone health is one. Um, how do we, our, our newer generation anti-seizure medications are, are better at, um, you know, I would say uh, don't have the, as many uh, associated 
uh, long-term side effects like having uh, problems with our nerves, like neuropathy, um, you know, having problems with our teeth and things like this. Um, but yeah, sure, the older medications have a lot of these um, long-term side effects. And uh, these are things that I think are important to, to know about. Um, but especially bone health, I think, is, is one that, to, that is important to have on the radar. Um, every medication that you take has the potential to have side effects. Um, so, but it's important to kind of keep all of those things in perspective as well. So, yeah. Okay, thank you.